the talk is MRI fistulography. So I'll try to simplify this topic as much as I can. And the essence of reporting MRI fistulogram is knowing the pelvic anatomy in great detail and knowing the pathophysiology and how the perianal fistulas may behave. Why we need to do MRI? Why not CT, fistulogram and other stuffs? All we know is it's non-invasive, no radiation involved, multiplanar capabilities are there. But the best thing why we do MRI is because it gives very good soft tissue contrast and spatial resolution. And with this, we get a detailed knowledge of relevant pelvic anatomy. We can see sphincters and fistulas directly and thereby we can classify the fistulas accurately and we can know where the fistula is, where the tract is, what is the exact length, where all it is extending, where is the internal opening, whether it is active or not, what are the branches, whether any ramifications are there or associated abscess is there or not. So coming to perianal anatomy, the anal canal is the structure between internal sphincters, external sphincters on either side and it is extending from the level of the levator ani to the level of the anal verge. Internal sphincter is nothing but extension of the inner circular muscle of the rectum. It extends down below the levator ani and then forms the internal sphincter. External sphincter is nothing but it is like condensation of levator ani. It condenses to form puborectalis somewhere here and extends down as the external sphincter. And in between these two sphincters is the intersphincteric space, which is I would say the fulcrum of reporting of MRI fistulography. And by the sides, there are ischioanal and ischiorectal spaces. So this is the drawing which I will be using to just simplify things further and having a better visual impact. So how do the sphincters look like? This is a T1-weighted image. This is a T2-weighted image. So the internal sphincters are gray are hypo-intense on T1-weighted images and a bit hyper-intense on T2-FS sequence. However, external sphincters, they remain hypo-intense on both T1 and T2-weighted fat-saturated sequence. And as we can see, this is the internal sphincter and external sphincter. And as we can see, the hyper-intensity in between these two sphincters is the intersphincteric space, which consists of fat areolar tissue. By and large, we need to understand this space is formed by fat. So if you identify the fat, then you can identify what you are dealing with and where the tract is. So why I call intersphincteric space as the fulcrum of reporting, at times the lesions are large and we don't know what we are dealing with. So come back to the intersphincteric space identify on T1 non-fat sat sequences and then maybe it will direct you better. And as we can see that this fat is getting suppressed on a T2 FS sequence and between the internal and external sphincters. This is uh, by the side is the issue NL fat. And there is a differential pattern of enhancement between internal sphincter and external sphincter. So external sphincter, since it is condensation of levator ni and then puborectalis and then forming the external sphincter. So it's basically a muscular uh, structure. So it does not have that much of blood supply to enhance intensely on contrast. However, we see that this is the internal sphincter and it shows relatively more enhancement as compared to the external sphincter on contrast. And uh, this is a coronal image and coronal images are equally important as uh, axial images. And we can see that the internal sphincter is enhancing throughout from the rectum. We go down, down and then entire internal sphincter is enhancing. However, external sphincter is condensation of the levator ni extends down and there is not much of enhancement in the external sphincter. So again, this diagram depicts the condensation of the uh, levator ni to puborectalis. And as we go down, we see that this is getting condensed and forming the external sphincter. So levator ni is an important muscle and it should be seen best, uh, should be assessed on coronal or a sagittal weighted images because of the extension of the tract, whether it is extending into supra 
area or not is important for the surgeons to know what is a perianal fistula perianal fistula is an abnormal connection between the epithelialized surface of the anal canal and then towards the skin if we do not see any of these opening clearly then it may be a sinus also but at times we don't see internal or external opening so primary cause of perianal fistula is basically 90% of the times uh, it's a primary cause uh, of perianal fistula which consists of infection of the anal gland it gets into some sort of obstruction there is impairment of the drainage leads to an abscess and then it ruptures and it will traverse into whichever space it finds and usually the space which is in proximity is the intersphincteric space in it goes to the intersphincteric space and then again it can traverse into various directions or it may not go into intersphincteric space it may traverse in like a transphincteric and go into a extrasphincteric course 10% of the causes of perianal fistula may be a crohn's disease like how uh, dr mitusha was talking about diverticulitis pelvic infection tuberculosis trauma say like a, a birth trauma anorectal cancer or a radiation therapy involved the usually perianal fistulas are more commonly affecting male population of 20 to 60 years of age group intersphincteric tracts are more common in occurrence compared to extrasphincteric and which are more common as compared to transphincteric tracts usually tracts are unilateral but we see all the combinations bilaterality is also seen and association with side branches and abscess is also very common and various permutations and combinations can occur i'll show you some of the examples so how do we do a mri fistulography so try to keep a marker t1 hyper intense marker at the site of the discharge if patient is saying that i had discharged from here then try to keep a marker over there because it will guide you in knowing the tract properly then axial oblique and coronal oblique images are taken orthogonal and parallel to the anal canal so first of all we'll take a sagittal view of the patient and then along perpendicular to the anal canal and oblique coronal to the anal canal the images are taken sequences taken are axial t1 axial t2 see if we see here we have included two of the sequences without fat saturation although the fistulas are best seen on fat saturated images we do not start just acquiring fat sat sequences and out no because we have to understand what is happening in the fat and we need to know the intersphincteric fat very well where it is so axial t1 axial t2 axial t2 fat saturated sequence coronal stir so sometimes the fistula is best seen on a stir so we are including one stir which is a coronal stir and then a post contrast weighted image so we acquire actually a 3d post contrast so that the image can be reconstructed in the desired plane and a coronal t2 if required and diffusion weighted images is optional so basically initially the classification which was given by the surgeons was a parks classification which did not uh, had the radiological uh, inputs into it so after mri coming into picture st james classification was given by actually radiologists so basically all these gradings are designed based on the location of the fistula what is the location the extent and associated complication the highest grading is like grade 5 in which the classification is based on supralevator extent so a supralevator extent even if it is not present you have to write down in as a pertinent negative finding in your report no supralevator extension noted no ramifications noted no obvious abscess noted in the present scan so these three things because these are there which surgeons are looking for should be included in a report you don't describe the tract and out no you have to write these things many times we see like a permutation and combination so giving a grading does not suffice uh, to the questions of the clinician so we have to follow this anal clock and where the anterior is like 12 o'clock position posterior is 6 o'clock position 
three o'clock is on the left and nine o'clock is on the right side. We all know, but the report has to go with this o'clock position, like where the tract is, what all o'clock position it is traversing, where is the internal opening and how high and below it is from the anal verge and what is happening to the supraelevator compartment. So how do fistulas look? So fistulas, usually they are hypo or iso intense on T1, basically not seen, not appreciated well on T1. But sometimes if they have blood, like because of post-operative status or something, they may appear bright on T1. So they are best seen on T2 weighted images and stir images and basically like a T2 fat saturated images. So wherein we are suppressing the fat and highlighting the fluid. So best seen on T2-weighted sequence or a T2-weighted FS or a STIR sequence. They show peripheral enhancement on contrast administration, usually most of them, because by the, usually when we are doing a scan, the tract is like an active uh, tract. And the shapes are like, it may be linear, curvilinear, horseshoe. And... Um, Abscess also are seen at times and which may show peripheral enhancement and, and a diffusion restricted weighted uh, restriction on a diffusion weighted sequence. So from the simpler ones to the complex one, I have few examples. So here we see that it's there's a bright spot in the six o'clock position and we see that it is in the intersphincteric space. There's some enhancement on contrast and then it is seen in the intersphincteric space and extending down. So it's like a simple intersphincteric fistula. There's no associated ramification, no abscess whatsoever. So again, here we see that there are two T2 hyperintense and enhancing tracts, but again, they are in intersphincteric space. So how do we know it is intersphincteric space? Because internal sphincter is enhancing, external is not enhancing, and it is lying between the two. If you want to confirm, we can see here that it is lying in the fat, which is suppressed on fat set sequence, or we can again go back to our T2-weighted sequences and confirm or T1 where the lesion is located. So bilateral intersphincteric fistulas. So this diagram is basically the green ring is the internal sphincter and the pink ring outside is the external sphincter. And this is the location where it is located. Here we see a complex appearing image, but we have bilateral internal uh, intersphincteric fistulas and sort of peripheral enhancing area in the intersphincteric space itself. And again, it is trying to extend down, but this is an example to show you intersphincteric fistula within intersphincteric abscess. So it's kind of a grade two as per the St. James classification. Again, enlarged or dilated intersphincteric space, or I would say intersphincteric tracts with peripheral enhancement, and it's bilateral. You can see that it is like extending from kind of the levator ni to the anal verge. Posteriorly, they are merging together and then trying to extend out. So basically, intersphincteric fistulas bilaterally with abscesses. So here, this example is basically to emphasize on the fat content of the intersphincteric space. We see the T1 hypo intensity abutting the internal sphincter, external sphincter, and but then obliterating the fat at this location. The fat on the opposite side is nice and bright. So it's a intersphincteric fistula and an abscess. But in association with that, sometimes you can see a perianal abscess and there may be no communication with the two. So here we see that there is an extra sphincteric tract. This is the internal sphincter, external sphincter, and then this is the extra sphincter tract coming, trying to come down with peripheral enhancement. And we can see that there are two internal uh, bright spots. At times, you may not see them to be like, you know, communicating throughout. It may be only like a bright spot, which may enhance, which may not enhance. And it can be like a presumed internal opening at six o'clock position and uh, 12 o'clock position. So there are various other fistula. So right side, we have intersphincteric fistula tracking outside into the extrasphincteric space. And on the opposite side also, we have another track like an extrasphincteric fistula. So these are like another examples of only extra sphincteric tracts. Here you see, this is the internal sphincter, external sphincter. Like we see, this is the anal canal and there are the diseases outside the anal canal. So basically these are all extra sphincteric tracts 
These may be extra sphincteric perianal sinuses. We can't demonstrate the internal opening. But then this question will remain whether there is internal opening or not. So we have to see carefully and we may not be able to demonstrate all the time. Here we see that there are multiple tracts in extra sphincteric location again and with a lot of ramifications. It's like difficult to show in one picture where all they are like arising from and extending. So extra sphincteric into multiple uh, with multiple ramifications. So here in this example, we can uh, show that there's a perianal abscess peripheral enhancing, a lot of perianal uh, fat stranding. But here we can appreciate that there is a suspicious opening, internal opening in this location. And so it becomes an extra sphincteric tract again with internal opening. So this is actually a very common picture which we see, extra sphincteric tract. Then ramification, it can go anywhere cranially. And uh, there is also some sort of abscess formation. So again, an example of that. So here we see that the extra sphincteric abscess has called actually causing significant involvement of the internal and external sphincters both. And there is restriction on diffusion related images. So extra sphincteric abscess with sphincter destruction. Here we see that there is a hyper intense tract from one o'clock position extending anteriorly, traversing through both the sphincters, enhancing on contrast. So this is an example of a transphincteric tract, only transphincteric tract, perianal fistula. But here we see that there is a transphincteric tract here, which is enhancing hyperintense on T2 with peripheral enhancement. So it's a transphincteric tract within abscess formation. So another example, a transphincteric tract with a extra sphincteric, trans extra sphincteric tract, like both are there. So this is also like to show the complexity of this situation. And at times we find it difficult how to describe, but then we have to describe like whatever we see combining two, three things together and then what you cannot combine then describing them separately. So this is an example to show that a perianal like extra sphincteric abscess has extending up. This is the ligator NI, which shows on the opposite side bright signal on T2 weighted images. And then it is inflamed and the abscess is seen extending into the supralevator space, indenting the base of the bladder. So transphincteric extra, like on the right side, it is transphincteric extra sphincteric. The left side, it is extra sphincteric extending with, into the pelvic space. Sometimes uh, we see that there is a abscess or a tract in the pelvic region and there is a supralevator collection also. So here we see this is the rectum, lower rectum, and there is a large collection in the perirectal space. But howsoever, we could not demonstrate the communication with the, with the two. So this invariably is a part of the perianal abscess which has extended cranially but then we can't demonstrate so it has to be described two different paragraphs and the communication could not be demonstrated in the present scan is would be a additional information which we can give and a follow-up maybe on follow-up you can demonstrate because in this case we could demonstrate on a follow-up so what is important to know is in perianal fistula whether it is communicating to the other structures like here we see that there's an ill-defined tract extending from the anal verge extending anteriorly and it is enhancing on contrast so basically it is a small transphincteric tract which has got communication with the vaginal cavity and this is a case or case of Crohn's. All we could appreciate was this thin tract, like few millimeters tract with peripheral enhancement, only appreciated on a contrast scan. And that also with like a MIPT images when we performed. So here we see that there is a transphincteric tract which is extending anteriorly and it is extending into the urethral region. So transphincteric tract with the urethral extension. Sometimes we see only tract in the posterior aspect without any communication with the perianal region, so a perianal sinus. And uh, the upper case is only a sinus, the lower case is a sinus with an abscess formation. And sometimes the perianal disease can be quite extensive. It can extend even above the levator ani, and there may be no communication with the perianal region, and which is what they want to know. 
So uh, here we see that there's a large uh, ischio anal abscess abutting the external sphincter, but whatsoever there is no communication. So it's like an extensive perianal or an ischio anal ischio rectal abscess. So here we had a case where in the fistula was very small. It's like a transphinctric fistula, which had a kind of a collection in the perianal region. But when we went up and uh, like traced the lesion further, we saw that there was an abscess which was being formed in the right obturator internus and patient was in septic shock. So basically fistula was very small, but then the repercussions were great. Sometimes we just see only an enhancement of the like relatively extra enhancement in the external sphincter or in the internal sphincter. That time you need to understand, is there any past history of any surgery? Sometimes post-surgical uh, changes also can enhance. So that is what we need to know in uh, detail. And sometimes it may be just an inflammation. It may be like uh, in future, it may form an abscess. So a clinical input and a follow-up study. So a reporting checklist, basically uh, what type of fistula you are uh, seeing and uh, what are the permutations and combinations, like basically what all side branches are there or not, where they are going, at what o'clock position, you can actually describe it is going, it's like curvilinear horseshoe from this o'clock position to that o'clock position and various other stuff. Then exact shape, length, width, we can measure the track like you know how many millimeters where it is maximum and uh, we have to give a report with respect to the anal clock and with respect to the distances from the anal verge and if there is any external opening and then the site of the external opening so and the condition of the internal and external sphincters supra levator extension is there or not and involvement of any other organ like involvement of vagina and urethra or any other structure. The MRI is a valuable tool for enabling us to know these uh, tracts to form a kind of a road map and identify associated complications and it will help surgeons for the surgical planning and a favorable outcome. Thank you. 